All right, we're going to uh, welcome on Pascal Lamy. He is uh, former Director General of the World Trade Organization and former EU Trade Commissioner. Welcome to the programme. You're giving a speech tonight um, about Brexit. I think you're also giving a speech about climate change um, and the current situation on Brexit. Now, you said this morning on the BBC on the Today programme that we made the wrong choice in negotiating withdrawal agreement first and then the rest. What did you mean? Well, I'm trying to understand why uh, both UK and the EU, a bit more UK than the EU, in this mess. It is a mess, and my conclusion, uh, my own interrogation, that it was always to be a mess. But some thought it wouldn't be. Mm. Some thought Brexit would be a sort of uh, short, surgical, deep plug operation. Mm. That was not to be. And that's you Brexit speaking, has so. always been, and we should have un understood that on both sides, by the way, mm. better at the beginning, a long, painful, unscrambling process. Right, well, that was you, wasn't well, it? Actually, I agree, with, I, I, I agree with uh, Shilami. I think the important point was the biggest mistake was made was right at the beginning when uh, the EU and the UK uh, agreed to put the withdrawal process first and separate that out from any kind of future relationship. I don't, and I spent uh, a week and a half ago, I spent uh, two hours with Mr. Barney and his team talking about how you can unscramble this separately, and I made a proposal. The point is... But did you think, first of all, but did you think it was going to be simple, surgical and easy? I never said it was going to be simple. I don't think it ever was going to be simple, but the key question was it could have been a lot easier. And I think the main point is that the two elements of those elements together, first of all, what dictates the way you leave and your future relationship are inextricably linked, because often the future relationship dictates <coughs> what kind of process of departure you have and therefore whether there's issues around money they're all dictated at the same time but to separate them has been an unmitigated disaster because it's meant we never get to the future relationship all right, well, no idea right, of it. let's remember that this very specific interpretation of article 50 was not the eu interpretation right. it was the british prime minister who was under formidable pressure from brexiters who said brexit is brexit we have to do it now we have to do it now. and in order to do it now let's start the process negotiate a withdrawal agreement and then we will see. Now, the we will see is now taking revenge. The reason why the thing doesn't work politically in the UK, it's not an EU problem. Huh? I mean, there's, in reality, there's never been a negotiation between EU and UK. The fundamental problem is whether UK can agree with UK on what Brexit is about, i.e., how much of regulatory divergence do the British people want? Yeah. Do they want a big divergence? Do they want a small divergence? If it's a big divergence, you exit a lot politically and economically, and this has a big cost. If you exit a little, this is a little political, but at a much lower cost. And this trade-off between how much you exit politically and how much you exit economically is not available for the moment, because it wasn't really search. That was to be determined later. All right. The later is taking revenge. Do you agree? Well, I actually was one of those that said <coughs> we should have settled where we were going to be as the number one priority of what we want. And this is the point I just made earlier. Uh, because we haven't sat down and agreed what the future relationship is going to be, which, by the way, dictates what those relationships are across the board, whether it's customs union or whatever, uh, then it's been the wrong way around. Now, I have to say quite categorically, um, the problem isn't just I've never been able to agree here. The truth is Parliament... But that is true, isn't it? Well, Parliament itself is not in agreement, really, with the British public, because the Parliament has been elected mostly full of people, like Vince, who just don't want to leave anyway. And the reality has been there for a process of blocking this. So, you know, with respect to Zilami here, domestically, the public said they wanted to leave, and we should have delivered the leave by now on the 29th of March. Uh, by not doing that has been the disaster. I'm I agree. I agree that the public decided they wanted to leave with absolutely no clue of what the implications of that would be economically. And were they, was that the politicians' fault? An inevitable but with respect, they were warned again and again, Mr. Lamy, by the Chancellor, by everybody else, it'll be a disaster if you go, it'll be economic suicide, the jobs will be lost. They were yeah, told yeah, all of that. Yeah, okay. They still uh, voted to leave. Yeah, they voted. The idea that somehow they had no idea what was going, they didn't believe that and they voted to leave. So let's get on with it. Look, look, I was the Chief of Staff of Jacques Delors in 1985 when we met with Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. and I was there and had a discussion with her whether moving the direction of the internal market was the right thing to do. And she said, yes, of course, mm -hmm. because integrating markets, reducing obstacle to trade, removing border is a great thing for us all, which it was. Now, if she was right, and I think the Tories roughly believe she was right, unless I don't understand properly British politics, moving the other way around is at a cost. If moving the single market, if integrating these economies, if removing the borders was so beneficial, 
going the other way around has a cost. Well, how much of a cost, how much of a <coughs> cost depends on how much UK <coughs> tends to <coughs> deviate from EU regulation. And back to this problem, and I agree with you, that's the big issue, but there is no compromise today. Yeah. And the fact that we've left the future open allows a sort of paranoia on both sides. Brexiters believe they will be cheated, and Remainers believe they will be cheated. <laughs> that's, that's, I think, what the next? Yeah. Well, I, I, actually, I think it comes down to one element. Uh, all of these are the debate about what the future relationship should be, but the truth is you could get this deal through if the EU and the UK were prepared to agree to the alternative arrangements on the Irish border, which allowed you to have no fixed border and the process. Now, these have been worked through, they've been proposed, but the government's yes. never put them to them. I spent uh, two hours with Giovanna the other day talking to others. They all know that this is where it's going to have to be because the existing backstop does not work in practice. It was plucked from Turkey and it does not work. All right. So the reality is doing that will get this agreement through and the rest is then down to about a year and a half's worth of serious negotiation about with, whether we want a trade deal, which I think respect, is our best response. With respect, I was the Director General of the World Trade Organization for eight years of my life, mm -hmm. which has something to do about custom procedures. Mm -hmm. I agree, yeah. And this notion that exiting the internal market implies no border on Ireland is pie in the sky. There's no way you can exit the internal market without a border. By the way, that is not the when, did we, when did we have the internal market? When we removed the borders. Yeah, yeah, but we didn't remember how to remove the border when we were outside of the Schengen Agreement. And the point is also worth remembering is that the existing borders, you take something like Rotterdam, which does all the ex the non-EU trade coming in, including SPS food markets, etc. They inspect less than 2% and they don't do it at the border. They do it well no. back from the fixed border. I'm sorry, I was over there. I went through it with them. The reality is technology now means no, no, the no, idea of barriers no, and borders is, no, is long sorry, gone. I'm absolutely well, sorry. I'll take you to Rotterdam. I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you this is a total confusion. Okay, look at Rotterdam. And by the way, which also exists on the labor side between the internal market and the customs union. The customs union is about tariffs, goods. Yeah. The internal market is about regulations. I agree. Now, if you want to diverge, yes. which is what you want to do, which will happen in the end, yeah. I think I think not much of that will happen in my, in my own view, but I may be wrong. If you want to diverge, you have to accept that there will be a border because we EU have to control things which abide to different regulatory requirements. Of course, but you'd work on the principle of two things. First is equivalence. The second, take, for example, the agreement Wait, that... Well, wait a minute. The, you, 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 with respect, Mr. Lamy. Equivalence is not the magic hang, hang, hang. No, it's not. But you, you know, here is an example. Take what New Zealand does with the EU. New Zealand is not a member of the EU. It's not a member of the single market. Its foodstuffs are not inspected here because why? They trust and agree that in New Zealand, the inspections that bring their standards right are at the same level or better than that of the EU. And they agree that that is done at the point of departure. <laughs> they are not done at the border. So the idea of this being a border point no, no, is I, completely I, incorrect. No, 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 it's not completely incorrect. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I agree that if you want trade to flow as nicely as possible, many of customs procedures have to be moved upstream, exactly. but you still need a border to check that this is the case. But the border is not, the right. of course it is. Is not there. Of course the border is, is a notional process that is about no, no, equivalence no. and agreement, not specific no, no. border checks. But, but, I mean, no, we'd agree no, about no, that, no, I think. No, no, no. What I, I would agree with is that equivalence is not a magic wand. You okay. only accept equivalence if you trust and if your collective preferences yes. are harmonized. I agree that, for instance, on beer, there is nothing that really says how you produce beer in the European Union. So there's beer in Belgium and in Bavaria and yeah. in Scotland. Yeah. And if, good, if beer is good for Scotland, it's good for Bavaria. Now, that is OK. Yeah. It's not going to be OK about GMO food or about chlorinated poultry. I'm sorry about that. We will not accept GMO food. Fine. If you want to accept, if you want to accept, if, I don't know whether or not, but yeah. if you want to accept chlorinated poultry, or GMO food, there will be a border and cost at the border. Who, who will put it up, though, Pascal? I mean, who will put <coughs> up the border? Because yes. um, the UK says they won't erect a, a border. Well, and doesn't want a hard border. Well, the well, EU, the the EU says they have pretty well said the same thing. The one the same same trade thing. organization won't be putting up a border. Will it? Well, the EU has pretty well said the same. The, the, the World Trade Organization won't be putting up a border. Will it? And uh, so did so the, the, the border. The border is something you need to protect your consumer your citizens from risk of imports that do not fit with your regulatory purposes. Yes. Take the example of the environment, for instance. Yeah. We have a relatively hyper environment protection standards in the European Union. If the UK exit and wants to move down, 
there will be controls at the border right, I, that environmental goods or even yeah. services are, are fit so that is that is not done at the border. Anything like that is done at the point of departure and the point of arrival. All right, while you're you, know, you do it for others it, like I'm, New Zealand. I'm going to bring things. Simply, uh, look, look I'm, at what happens. Yeah, yeah, so, can, can I just say? I mean, it is a very instructive conversation, <laughs> actually. which is why I didn't interrupt. But you know, Mr. Lam is a public servant, right? Who has headed the World Trade Organization for eight years, actually understands trade law and trade procedure, which is why all this simplistic Brexit stuff is so. But what Ian can't get away with is just trying to say, well, it's all the fault of Parliament and people like me. I've been completely open and honest about the Liberal Democrats' opposition to Brexit from day one. We're not dissimulating in any way, whatever. But what's, what Mr Lamy has brought out with crystal clarity is that we're not dealing with, you know, Brexit isn't a binary issue. You know, you're in or you're out. We've got a whole range of Brexit options. That is the single point. That is why Parliament is paralysed, because the Brexiteers cannot agree amongst themselves what form of Brexit they want. And that's why we're having these elections. That's why we're in a complete bind. All right, well, let's, um, let's sort of move further, if you like, into the elections that are coming up, local and European elections. Is this, is it trade that's talked about on the doorsteps with Brexit? Did you notice in all your discussions that you've had with local constituents that this argument that Ian Duncan Smith and Pascal and me are having, was that something that people knew about? Uh, no. Right. I, so, uh, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did two, uh, two big kind of in-depth features at the weekend, about, um, particularly about local <clears> elections. And the first one was speaking to people in the parts of Greater Manchester that, where virtually nobody votes, up to kind of 82, 83% of people. What was really noticeable, um, I think you can sometimes overstate how much local elections are a proxy for uh, the national picture. This time, though, it was quite striking that people were talking about Brexit on the doorstep. They were, or certainly in leave areas anyway, people are talking about Brexit. And when we asked people why they weren't voting, whereas in previous years they might have just said, oh, you know, there's no point, I don't like politicians, this time it was, I voted in 2016, mm -hmm. yeah. nothing has happened. I'm not going to vote again. And we had a lot of people saying we're never going to vote again. I think you're absolutely right. I think the big issue is the distrust in politicians. It's that thing of, but I haven't seen anything happen. And the problem is, locally, you have that issue of the pothole that wasn't dealt with or that other problem that you've, you've spotted and you've seen and it's still a problem. So you get that general distrust of, well, nothing happens at a council level, nothing's happening at a national level. Does anyone really listen to me and does anyone really care what I think? And I think austerity feeds into that as well because councils have been underfunded now for the best, well, at least have had their budgets reduced over the course of nearly a decade. So councils are themselves less able to do mm. the things that they used to be able to do. So, you know, say you vote for a councillor and the councillor gets in, they're probably less likely to be able to fix whatever the thing was that you were annoyed about in the first place than they would have been 10 years ago and then that's compounded by what's going on in Westminster. Do you think Brexit's going to happen, um, Pascal and me? I mean, I've probably changed my mind 24 times since... In the last uh, hour? Since, <laughs> since, since the referendum took place. <laughs> I mean, and where are you today? No, I'm... My, my, my heart is, of course, not with Brexit, but I have to work with uh, my expertise and my guts. Uh, I think the likelihood of non-Brexit is low, but higher than it was a year ago, uh, and uh, a year ago uh, it was a bit higher than the day after the referendum. And I think the reason for that is that sort of the reality of the problem of unscrambling is slowly percolating, whereas a huge simplification, and I think uh, Vince Cable was right, that the sort of either in or out, people are starting to realize it's more complex than that. Now, of course, it leads to a lot of absurdity. The fact that UK who voted to leave in June 2016 is now having to vote to elect mm. European parliamentarians a month from now because this is the law and it's the law that UK people as long as UK have the right to vote. I mean, right. This is, the, frankly speaking, this is absurd and, yeah. and this notion, and well, this notion you, that you, these people who will be legitimately elected members of the European Parliament will vote in a new commission and then exit. Just make absolutely... I mean, well, Ian Douglas Smith agrees with you on that. He agrees with you on that point. And on that, I'm going to uh, say... Yeah, that's, that's um, thank you very much for coming in.